Hey Calvary, it's uh, intern Ben here again, and uh, welcome to Church Online. We're so excited for you guys to be here. Um, it's really just a, a great day to worship God and be together uh, virtually. So thank you for coming, and uh, I'm really excited for this. Now as we prepare to, to regather in the church, I have a few uh, important dates I want you guys to, to know about. So on Thursday, June 10th, uh, I'm going to be uh, t- preaching at uh, The Root. Um, We've just selected uh, June to be the month where I do all my uh, requirements for my credit and the internship. So I'm all you rooters out there, make sure you're there June 10th. Uh, I'm going to be uh, preaching and, and talking to you guys, doing a little Bible study. Uh, on June 16th, that's a, a Wednesday, I'm going to be do, doing a church-wide Bible study. Now we're hoping we can do this in person, not indoors, unfortunately, but we're hoping we can be outside in person, socially distanced, and uh, we can do that. So mark that on your calendars, Wednesday, June 16th, uh, Bible study with Ben. Now, uh, June 20th is going to be our, hopefully our first Sunday back together, uh, regathered. Um, again, it'll probably be outside, uh, rain or shine. If it's shine, bring your camp chair, bring, uh, bring an umbrella, bring whatever you need, and sit outside in, the, in our parking lot, and we'll do, we'll do service outside. If not, if it's raining, come in your cars. We'll stay in your car. We have an FM transmitter now, so we're going to transmit it over the radio. So I'll be preaching that day as well, June 20th. Um, so make sure you're there. Um, and it'll just be super exciting to get back together. Now, I mentioned this last week, but uh, Saturday, July 3rd is the Fish Derby and Barbecue. Again, I, I, I've been tasked with planning that event, so I'm really excited to, to kind of get a good event for you guys. So mark that in your calendars, Saturday, July 3rd, uh, Fishing Derby, and uh, it's going to be $10 per person, and more details for that are going to come out next week. Now, I'm really excited to announce today uh, with Pastor Adam on holidays. We have a guest speaker here. It's Pastor John Ferreira from Willowdale Pentecostal Church. Um, we're really excited to have him here preaching today. So I uh, gave him a warm welcome from your living rooms. And, uh, and we're really excited about that. Now, I'm going to open up the, the service in prayer and we'll, we'll keep going. Dear God, I just, uh, thank you so much for, for this service today. I thank you so much that we can be here um, together virtually, but still together. Um, I just pray that your spirit would be here in this, uh, in this service today. I pray that your spirit would be with Pastor John as, as, he, as he preaches and as he speaks your word. I pray that you would speak through him to us. And uh, just pray that despite the feeling as though we're apart, I pray that your spirit would enter everyone's room right now, enter everyone's house and, and just um, let them know that we are together, um, that you are present everywhere and you're not limited by a computer. And I just pray that we know that today. And I pray that we can get back in, in person and regather together soon. But uh, today I just pray your spirit be here with us always. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Calvary. Enjoy. Now praise becomes your house, your place. 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 Here we go. Now praise becomes. Your house, your place, now praise becomes your house, your place, now praise becomes oh, your house, your place, oh God. We sing a song. We sing a song and you come in, make a dance and you come in, shout your name and you come in, give you praise and you come in. We sing a song and you come in, make a dance and you come in, shout your name and you come in, give you praise. For you and I the praises of your people. Hey! 
Pastor Magna and Pastor Anissa from the Powell Family Five, we just congratulate you on getting your credentials this past Wednesday. We just want to know how proud we are of you, and uh, this is just one more step in other people recognizing the call of God that is on both your lives. God bless, and we look forward to what else the Lord is going to do through your ministries. Congratulations, Pastor Magna and Anissa. We're really excited for you guys. Yay! Pastor Magna, Pastor Anisha, congratulations. Job well done. You guys are great. Hey, Magna, congratulations. You got your credentials. Woo! So proud of you. Wow, from the first time you were preaching in youth at 16 about the almond tree, and look where you are now, girl. You are on fire. So proud of you. Love you. Congrats. Pastor Magna and Pastor Anissa, I just want to extend my congratulations to both of you. So excited. Um, so excited for your future. Aside from being credentialed, you two have a commitment and a quality of character that's incredible. It's so recognizable. You're going to do great things for the kingdom. And uh, we're just, we're all so excited for you guys. You are huge assets to Calvary Community Church. And we're so thankful to have you both. So congratulations. Enjoy this. We're looking forward to the future. Have a great day. Pastors Anissa and Magna, you are credentialed. That's hugely, hugely exciting. Congratulations. Yeah, you're definitely official in our minds, but we're so, so thrilled for you. Hey guys, congratulations, Pastor Nisa and Pastor Magna on your credentials. I'm so happy for you and I can't wait to see what God has for you guys. Congratulations! Thank you ladies for stepping up and stepping out. Remember, testimony is important and never outwalk your peace. Have a great new journey as pastors for Calvary and who knows where the future will lead. We congratulate you and thank you for everything that you do. Yeah, Pastor Magna and Nisia, you know, God said that even uh, in a time of exile, when people had to, uh, you know, be locked down, He said, I know the plans and the purposes that I have for you, and they're for a hope and a future. And so we just pray for great things for you, not only now, for the long-term future. God bless and so glad to be a part of your lives. Wow, congratulations ladies. God has good plans for you. On behalf of the Eva Hart household, I want to say congratulations, Pastor Magna and Pastor Anita, on getting your credentials. Williams family, we just want to congratulate Pastor Magna and Pastor Anicia <laughs> on um, this big, massive accomplishment. As we know how much work it, it took, and uh, Olivia just want to say that Pastor Anicia, you're the best kids pastor ever. No, honey. Just a minute. We have something special for you here. Don't do Yeah! Yeah! Calvary Berry, how you guys doing today? My name is John Ferreira, and I'm excited to bring you the Word of God this morning. Um, I've known Adam Powell for a number of years, and it's a privilege, and it's an honor for me to be here, to be leading you guys, to be sharing God's Word today. So hopefully you can lean in, and you can learn something from what God's teaching you today. So the title of my talk today is called, How to Get Your Edge Back, or Getting Your Edge Back. And I'd love to start here. So when we talk about what it means to get our edge back, what it means to look at our landscape of our world, uh, there's some weird things that we all do and operate as people. Let me tell you one thing. So for me, I'm an immigrant. I don't know if you can tell, but I actually was not born in Canada. I actually came to Canada when I was about like 12 years old or so. And one of the weirdest things that I had to endure and learn about when I was in Canada was peanut butter. 
I did not understand what peanut butter was. And that was one of the things that when I came here, people would put peanut butter and jelly on like bread and they put it together. And that completely baffled me. And I really thought that was a super weird thing. But just like I thought that was a weird thing, the Bible actually has some really weird and obscure stories um, that that it's kind of just thrown in together. And sometimes if you're reading it, you kind of look at it and you're just like, really? Like, what was that about? How was that relevant? And one of the things I want to do today is explore one of these really intricate and weird passages in the Bible today. And as we look at this story, this one statement and one truth really rings out true for me. And it says, God knows how to help you find what you didn't mean to lose. So, That's why the title of my talk is called How to Get Your Edge Back. So God helps us find something that we didn't mean to lose. Now, have you ever lost something ever in life? I don't know about you, but I've lost many things. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, I lost my wallet. And when I lost my wallet, I thought, you know, I've only got a couple of places that I really keep my wallet in. And so I thought, you know what, let me look there. Okay, it wasn't there. Let me look here. It wasn't there. And I kind of waited a few days because I was busy and I was kind of doing stuff and, you know, we're all stuck at home. It's stay-at-home order. So, you know, I wasn't really stressed about finding it. I knew it was somewhere around. I just didn't know where it was. And so I went about a week not knowing exactly where my wallet was. And then finally, I was able to find it. And, you know, just in time when I needed my health card for my vaccine and all that kind of stuff like that. But You know, just in the same way when we lose our physical things, we can actually lose out spiritually. We can lose our spiritual selves a little bit. Uh, You know, maybe you were really fired up for God at one point, you know, when you got saved and when you first gave your heart to Jesus and, and, you know, you were just like, yeah, I love God. I'm so passionate about him. And then over time, it kind of fades away, you know, and maybe you were just really a joyful person. You know, maybe you started 2019 as an extremely joyful person, and now we're in 2021, and it's not that joyous. You know, it just kind of feels like we're, you know, kind of going through the works and kind of going through the mud there. You know, and maybe you felt or have seen a really clear picture of what God has for you, or you've seen it and you were really kind of going for it, and you were passionate, and as life has gotten in the way, different circumstances have changed your way, and you've kind of now lost that picture, or it feels impossible, you know, to see the vision that God has given you. See, we can lose things spiritually in our lives, and we don't mean to, and sometimes it happens quickly, or it just kind of happens over time, just like the last year and a half has changed the way we do church, and changed the way we meet as community, and, and we don't mean to lose our spiritual edge, you know, but sometimes we lose it, and we lose our passion for God. But that's where I want to start today. I want to explore some things of how God can help us find what we didn't mean to lose and help us get our edge back by exploring a really weird story about a floating axe head in the Bible. Like to me, this is a peanut butter jelly story, if I could, if I could say it that way. So I want to give you some context before I read this story. So we find this story in, in 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 1 to 7. And it, and it literally is titled, An Axe Head Floats in the Bible. I believe some Bibles are titled that way when, when you read this story. But I want to give you some context to this story. So this story centralizes around a prophet named Elisha. Now, Elisha was a pretty a prominent prophet in, in the Old Testament. He was a biblical prophet. In fact, he has the most recorded miracles in the Bible, anyone outside of Jesus. And so Elisha was really no stranger to the move of God and seeing the miraculous things, so much so that there were prophets and young men and young women that would come around and and learn from Elisha. And so we find this story at the start where Elisha is teaching this group of young prophets. And as he's teaching them, it's growing and growing so much so that the space that they're in gets too small. And so they have to build a bigger space in order to accommodate more of these younger prophets that want to learn from Elisha. So we see in the start of the story where Elisha and these prophets are setting out to build a bigger space so that they can gather together and learn uh, from God and learn from Elisha. So this is where we, where we pick up in second Kings chapter six, verses one to seven. And I'm going to read it out to you, but it's going to pop up on the screen for you. It says the company of the prophets said to Elisha, look, the place where we meet with you is too small for us. Let us go to the Jordan where each of us can get a pole and let us build a place there for us to meet. And he said, go. Then one of them said, 
Won't you please come with your servants? I will, Elisha replied, and he went with them. They went to the Jordan and began to cut down trees. And as one of them was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water. Oh no, my Lord, he cried out. It was borrowed. The man of God asked, where did it fall? When he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick and threw it in there and made the iron float. Lift it out, he said. And then the man reached out his hand and took it. And just like that, this story is over. Just like that, it's done. It abruptly stops. And when we look at the story, it's kind of like a weird story. I know I read it to you and you're just kind of like, oh, okay, cool. John, you read a story about an axe head and it fell in the water and Elisha did something and made it float. All good. It, it kind of feels like a really passing story. And it seems pretty obvious. So why this miracle? That's where I start with this. Because when you think about it, if you were to put an axe head, I think we can all imagine this is the metal head that we, if you imagine an axe, you use it to cut down trees and stuff like that, or bushes and whatnot. And an axe head is made out of metal. So if I were to put it in a thing of water, it probably, most likely, 100% would sink to the bottom. So when we read this, it's kind of a very obscure miracle. It's kind of like, okay, why is this in the Bible? Why is this recorded? Like God had used Elisha for some pretty um, radical miracles in the Bible. He had raised a man from the dead, had cleansed a body of water from a community that was in drought. He had healed a man of leprosy. He had blinded an entire army to save Israel. Like these are some amazing miracles when we read about Elisha's kind of uh, prophet, like as he worked as a prophet. But this one just kind of seems weird and obscure. So why is this miracle performed? And more importantly, why is this one recorded in the Bible? Why did God choose for this specific story to be part of his word? And what does it mean? What does it mean for my life? What does it mean for your life? But it comes down to three little words that, that to me is very important. And we find it in verse five. It says, as one of them was cutting down a tree, the iron head fell to the water. Oh no, my Lord, he cried out, it was borrowed. You see, the young prophet, the young prophet that, that was using that axe, he was kind of stuck in, in, a, in a conundrum. You see, that axe wasn't his, it was borrowed. So for him, he could not afford to replace that axe head. But let me give you some context because you and I would look at that axe head and when we read that story, we would say like, that's not that big of a deal. I could hop over to Canadian Tire or right now, probably not. We would probably have to go on Amazon, order that and have that delivered to our house or delivered to the person that we borrowed it from. But it probably wouldn't cost us more than 30, 40 bucks to get an axe, like a really good one. So that doesn't seem like much. But back in the, in the context of the Bible, that meant a lot because you have to think about it. This axe head was an expensive thing. It was a piece of metal that not only had to be mined and, and the iron had to be mined out, but it had to be forged, it had to be taken to a blacksmith, it had to be shaped, sharpened, and then it constantly had to be oiled so that it wouldn't rust, so that it could be used for the purpose of an axe. So losing an axe head for a young prophet was a huge debt, and it was a debt that he could not repay. And this is kind of where God steps in. And I don't know about you, but I really look at this and I see some parallels for me and my life. And, and I hope that you can see some parallels for you. But when the accent was borrowed, so are we. See, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, it says, Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God brought, bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. See, just like the Acts said, as Christ's followers, as Christians, as people, we are borrowed. We, sin owned us, but we were bought at a high price by Jesus. And now we live on this earth on borrowed time. See, Je Jesus purchased us, and every breath that's in our lungs, every time we wake up in the morning, that is a gift from God. He gives us an opportunity, another day to, to come and serve him and, and give us an opportunity to lead others to the saving knowledge of Jesus, an opportunity for us to honor and love him and revel in him. But he purchased us. So our body, our health, our life is given to us by God. And our gift back to him is what we do with the time that we've been given here. See, this story is a little glimpse into who Jesus is and a reminder of the payment that Jesus, you know, paid for us, the debt that he paid for us. But why an axe head? It seems so irrelevant. But you see the thing, with an axe, it has a very specific purpose. 
In fact, it is shaped, sharpened, and fashioned for one purpose, just like you and I. The job of an axe, and I think we all know what the job of an axe is, is to cut down whatever it strikes. And most times, axes are used to cut down trees. It has a very specific purpose. It was created on and for a purpose. Just like us, we are created for a purpose, to move the kingdom of God forward. We have been shaped and sharpened that way with a specific edge. And if we lose our spiritual edge in our lives, we are about as useless to God as an axe head in the water. Ooh, that one hurts. I know that one hurts. But the axe head under the water cannot be used. It cannot serve its purpose. In fact, in the water, it will get rusty and it will not even look like an axe head anymore. It will look like a piece of metal that was just rusted out. When we lose our edge, we start to rust away. We start to leave the plan and the purposes of God. You see, maybe you started out busy, you know, chopping away when we're, when, we're, when we're working with God. You started out on fire. You're like, man, I can do this. I got my purpose. I can work in it. But over time, you know, we start to lose our edge. Well, you know, my family, you know, is, is demanding more of my time. You know, my business is demanding more of my time. My job is taking more of my time. I can't commit to church. I can't commit to this and that. And we start to slow down. We start to, you know, not even realize that we're not making a difference. We're not even chopping away. And then sooner or later, our edge, our, our edge on the ax gets dull. And we're just chopping, but we're not making a difference. And then eventually, we don't even realize it, but the ax head has flown off. And we're just swinging away, wasting our energy, and not making a difference. Sometimes when our passion is gone, when it seeps out of us, it doesn't just happen to us in the moment. It kind of takes a longer view of it. You know, maybe a pandemic that doesn't allow us to meet as believers take, takes that away from us. We stop meeting together as people. We stop using the tools that are available to us so that we can connect with one, or one another. We can pour into each other. We can mentor each other. We can grow with each other. We stop calling each other. We stop texting each other because it seems too inconvenient. Because the convenience of not being able to meet together is now gone. So we start to lose our edge. We start to lose our passion. And all of a sudden, we don't even realize that we've completely lost our edge because we've completely lost the accent. We've lost our purpose. Do you feel that way today? Well, I have some really great news for you if you do. Because we serve a God who wants to help us find what we've lost, to help us get our edge back. So how do we get our edge back? Now, if we look deeper in the story, we really find step-by-step -step instruction on what to do when we lose our spiritual edge and how to get it back. So let's start, let's start here in the first one. So verse 5, it says, As one of them was cutting down a tree, the iron head um, fell to the water. Oh no, my Lord, he cried out. It was borrowed. See, these three little words, he cried out. So if you want to get your spiritual edge back, you got to realize that you cannot, you cannot do it on your own. We have to cry out to God. You see, that's the beauty of kids. See, when a kid falls, or I have a three-year-old daughter. Now, my daughter is very much like me. Extremely fun, sassy, but also stubborn. Like stubborn as a bull. The girl sometimes will not listen. When she makes her mind up, that's what she wants to do. And when she chooses to do something, even if she's warned, she still wants to go about it and do it, wants to do it her way. I want to carry this big thing down the stairs. I'm like, listen, if you carry that, you're going to fall with it because you're, you're small. But she's like, no, I'm not small. I can do it. And she wants to do it and wants to prove that she can do it. But inevitably, whenever she fumbles or stumbles or falls down the stairs, the very first thing she does is cry out to her parents. Mommy, daddy cries out for one of us. See, that's the beauty of God, is that when we stumble, when we fall, we can cry out to our Father in heaven. He is our dad. We can cry out to him. When you, when you feel discouraged, when you feel tired, when you feel passionless, if you feel underwater, if you feel stuck at the bottom, you can cry out to God. He'll meet you there. When you hurt yourself, you can cry out to him. See, that's what I love about this story. It seems so random and so weird and so out of place. It's just an accent. But why is it comforting to me? Because I get, and hopefully you're, you're seeing that, we can see a glimpse of God's heart for us. 
We don't serve a God that he's not too big for us. He cares about the little things. That's why God, I believe, performed this miracle. That's why he worked through Elisha to get this axe head back because God cares about the littlest parts of who we are. We got a headache, God cares. If the car won't start, God cares. You got a test this week, God cares. You can't make the bills this week, God cares. You're conflicted with a friend, God cares. You see, I told you the story about how I lost my wallet earlier and I said I couldn't find it and I eventually did find it. See, I didn't tell you the other part of that story of how I found it because I was really stressed out because it was Monday, Tuesday and my vaccine was coming up on Friday and I know I needed to find it because I needed my health card. And so I was really stressed and I'm looking all over the place, frantically got, got my wife involved and I got some of my students involved helping me look for it because they were in some of my office spaces so they might know where it might have ended up. And I'm like frantically now stressed out after about a week and a half not being able to find it. And I've never left my house or my office space. So I'm like, it's got to be somewhere around here. Checking my car is everything. And then finally, my father-in-law challenged me and said, hey, have you prayed about it? And I'm just like, pray about it? It's my wallet. What do you mean pray about it? I just got to find it. I got to find where I put it. He's like, well, pray about it. He's like, God cares about the little things. So pray about it. He cares about the lost things. So I'm like, fine, I'll pray about it. So I sure enough, I prayed to God. And my, my prayer wasn't even that grand. It was just, all right, God, like, you already know I lost my wallet, cannot find it, really stressed out, dude. My vaccine is coming up. I do not want to book another one. It already took me forever to book it. So can you please give me some insight into finding where this wallet is? I know this sounds incredibly stupid, but I really need your help. I need your help to find this wallet. Please, if you have any insight to where I left it, I would love, I would love some insight. I went to bed that night, and I know this is going to sound really trippy, but I'm giving 100% credit to God on this one. I woke up the next morning, and, and I had this dream. The only thing of that dream I remember was a very specific bomber jacket I was wearing, and in this dream, I put my hands in the pocket. I pulled my wallet out, and I paid for something. I woke up saying, maybe it's in that jacket, but I'm also t- doubting myself because I'm like, I haven't worn that jacket in weeks. Why would it be there? I don't even know where that jacket is. That's how long I haven't worn it. And it's hot outside, so I'm not wearing jackets. So I said, fine, let me go find it. And I had, it took me like 10 minutes to even find this jacket because I haven't worn it in so long. Sure enough, I slipped my hand into the pocket, right side pocket, there was my wallet. Right there. Pulled it out, and I just said, thank you, God. Thank you. Because I knew that if it wasn't for him, I would have never, ever thought to check there. Ever. Ever. See, God cares about the little things. I know that seems really funny, but he really does care. We got to stop crying to God just for the big stuff. We got to cry out to God even for the small stuff, the everyday stuff. When we fight, when we do this, when we do that, we really got to come to God. And that looks, that, that's different. It looks different. Journaling, getting, with, getting to him with prayer, coming together with him, worship, Whatever that is for you. Sometimes for me, it's frustratedly like I told you how I prayed to God. It was frustration. Out of frustration, I'm talking to him. But sometimes I talk to him out of joy. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for letting me find this. Sometimes I cry. But we got to come to God. We got to go to him. Now, there's also a practical part of the story that we can lean into, and I want to point this out for you. In verse 6, it says, The man of God said, Where did it fall? And then Elisha said, when he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick, threw it in there, and made the iron head float. So the second thing of how we can get our spiritual edge back is be honest about where you lost it. See, Elisha asked the prophet where he fell, where it fell, because he was pointing out a truth. It's not gone. It's just where you left it. You see, I'm a gamer. At least I fancy myself a gamer. I do it from time to time. But one of my favorite games uh, is Crash Bandicoot. Now, if you've ever played it, um, it's a super old game from like the 90s. It was like the very first game that I'd ever played as a kid. And it kind of came out the uh, last couple of years as a remaster. So, of course, I had to buy it, had to have it. And I was playing it. And, and I forgot how the game worked. And I got frustrated because the whole point of the game is to get my little Crash Bandicoot character from one end to, of this journey to the end of the, from the start to the end. But there's like little checkpoints in the middle. And every time my character died, he would start off at the last checkpoint that I, I didn't have to start it at the beginning. I would just go to the last checkpoint 
that I had died at. So if I, as long as I got to that checkpoint, anytime I died in between there, I would just make it to that checkpoint. And I wouldn't have to start at the beginning of the level, which was great because that would be really frustrating to me. See, that's the great thing about crying out to God and being in relationship with him. Because when you lose your spiritual edge, you don't have to start all over. You don't have to start from the beginning. You just have to go back to the place that you lost it, where you got off track, because he's waiting for you right there. I'd love to give you this illustration here that, that may kind of highlight and bring this together for you. From time to time, God challenges me when I'm driving, I'm walking. I don't really do a whole lot of walking. I, I drive most of the time, but from time to time, he'll challenge me to help somebody out. You know, I'll see somebody with a, with, a, with a sign saying, hey, I need money or I'm hungry or whatever. And I'll feel him kind of in my spirit remind me, hey, go help that person out. So, you know, I'll have to take time out of my day, go get a gift card or something or buy them a meal. Whatever I feel in, that God is challenging me in that moment, I do it out of obedience. But when I, first, when I first started working with God on this, the very first time I started working with God on this, you know, I was like very kind of like prideful Christian. I'm like, all right, I'm going to help somebody out today, right? Like, okay, cool. I see that person. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy him a meal. So I, I got out of my way, went into Starbucks, stood in line, bought him a meal, a drink, this and that. And I went over to the guy and I gave it to him. And I was highly offended because he just kind of like went like, okay, and just grabbed it from me and just like kept walking and looking for money. And I didn't even get a thank you. I was just like, I walked away just like offended. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm like, I gave my time. I, was, I went out of my way. And like, this person can even thank me. God, like, really? Like, this is the kind of people that you're asking me to serve? And I was really upset. And I was actually fighting with God in this. I'm like, I'm never going to go out of my way to, to help people like this. And in that moment, God reminded me and he said that it wasn't about the other person. In fact, it was actually all about you, John. It was all about, can you be obedient to me? Can you obediently do what I'm asking you to do? Can you trust me that you may not see the picture, you may not see what's happening, that I've got that taken care of, but all I need you to do is be obedient to what I'm asking you to do. See, God was trying to teach me something because I got embarrassed and I got offended and I was prideful that I did something out of my way and I didn't even get a thank you. And it was awkward and I got off track there a little bit. And in that moment, God reminded me where I had lost it right there. That I was obedient, but I was doing it out of false humility. I was doing it out of a pride inside of myself, saying that I could help this person. Rather than God's resources through me could help this person. But I had this false pride in me, or this false humility in me, that said that, oh yeah, I can help this person. And I was looking for credit. And in that moment, God said, yes, you're obedient, but you're not obedient to me wholeheartedly. You're obedient to me to get something out of it for yourself. And John, I want to help you work on this. And I had to be honest with God and allow God into that part of my life so that he could work that out for me so that I could really learn to trust him on things. And so from that point on, I leaned into God completely on those things. And I, and I obediently say, God, whatever you're doing in and through me, thank you for using me. Thank you for like giving me the resources so I can bless somebody. And I'm extremely joyful that whatever comes out of that, you get the glory. And I may never see it. I may never see the fruits of what happens there. But I'm just thankful that I was used in the process, that I could serve the kingdom this way. And through that, God worked on my heart, worked on my humility, allowed me to now start blessing people and just planting those seeds, even though I may never get to see the harvest of it. But through that journey, God brought me to the place where I had lost it. I didn't even know I had lost it. But he reminded me and I was able to track back where I had lost it and then allow God to work a miracle inside of me so that I could keep continuing down my journey. Maybe it's a sin issue though. Maybe it's a sin that you keep getting stuck in over and over again. Maybe you lost your spirituality because you keep, you feel like you're letting God down every time. But I'm here today to tell you that God is the God of grace and God wants to work in and through your lives. And you don't have to just keep wishing you could make a different choice. If you cry out to God, if you track back with God where you lost it, he's going to help you. He's going to do a miracle inside of you to get your edge back. And that's the amazing thing about God is that he doesn't want you to live in regret. He doesn't want you to live in the, in the place of like, oh, I made those mistakes. I can't be anything now. 
I can't do those things that you gave to me. I can't pursue those visions that, that you had for me. I can't pursue the purpose that you've clearly laid out for me because I keep doing this, so I'm stuck in this. But God's saying, can you cry out to me? Can you trust me? Can you show me where you lost it? Can you bring me to the place where you lost it? Can you obediently take me there and allow me to work a miracle in your life? Because see, God is a gentleman. He's not gonna force his way into your life. He's gonna wanna work with you. He's gonna want an invitation into your heart. And when you allow God into those spots, when you allow God to work in an area, when you show him the area where you lost it, well, then he's gonna do a miracle for you. And that's the last step. Verse seven shows us the final step. It says, lift it out, he said, and the man reached out his hand and took it. You gotta take back what you lost. And we can only do that through obedience. You see, we cry out to God and he'll be in the middle of it. He'll forgive you and restore you. And then God does the miracle. He makes the ax head float. But the prophet had to reach out his hand and lift it out. We have to be obedient to what God's asking us to do. See, God will perform a miracle. He can perform miracles in our lives. But we still have to walk that out. We still have to walk in the miracle. We gotta walk through the calling. We gotta walk into our purpose. We gotta take that step of obedience to go there with God. We can't look back and say, but I did this and I did that. I can't be used by God. God's saying, no, 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 I already changed that. I did a miracle. I restored you. I brought you up. I lifted the ax set out of the water. Only I can do that, God said. But now we gotta walk in. We gotta reach out and pick it out of the water. Pick back up our edge. Put it back on the ax handle and go to work. You see, nothing has changed in 3,000 years since this story. Our calling is fulfilled. Our edge is sharpened one obedient step at a time. It's not about perfection. It's about progression. When you choose to pick up the ax and swing it in your purpose, you make a choice every single time to move in God's kingdom, to move in the purpose that he's called you out. And that's the thing about right now in our world, in our landscape, is that we're being forced. It feels like we're being forced into isolation, but God's calling us into the kingdom and he's calling us to use our purpose, to use our accent, to swing and make a difference in the kingdom. And the tools are right there available to us. But God's saying, can you trust me to perform a miracle? Can you trust me to pull you up to where you lost it, from where you lost it, to pull you up into purpose and get your edge back? See, following Jesus is about keeping our passion in pursuit of him at all times. That's what I love about God. God is always in the business of giving us new insight to do things. We're living in a time where it feels that we're the most isolated in the world, but yet we're still the most connected we can ever be. Through technology, through the tools that are at our disposal, we can reach far more people than we could have ever reached before. Imagine if these tools were available to the, to the disciples, to Paul, Peter, Philemon, like all these guys that were out there doing God's business, imagine if they had these tools available to them to reach people on the other side of the planet in real time. Woo! The amount of damage they could do for the kingdom. But see, God's entrusting us right here, right now. He's given us all the tools and resources. Now, can we pick back up our edge? Because life has gotten in the way. Life has slowed us down a little bit. I'm admitting to that myself. But I'm also looking at a God who can do miracles, a God who can pick back up the accent from the bottom of the water that only he can do. And now I just gotta know where I lost it. I gotta trust God, accept his miracle, accept what he's done for me and walk right back in my purpose, walk right back up in where God's called me to be. And that's my challenge to every single one of you. As Christ's followers, followers of Jesus, as disciple makers, makers of others, can we follow in our purpose? Can we be community even when it feels like we cannot be? When the easement of community of not being able to gather in person isn't there, can we still create community? Can we still reach out to our neighbors? Can we still reach out to our coworkers? Can we reach out to our friends? Can we love people still despite the circumstances that we've been handed? I really believe as Christ followers that we can. I believe that when we're operating in our purpose, when we're operating in our calling, when we're able to sharpen our edge and, and attack those trees in our lives, metaphorically, that God can work incredible things through us. He can really drive us up and we can walk in kingdom purpose. And no matter what restrictions are imposed on us, we can still move the kingdom forward. We can still be the community. We can still be the church. 
but are you willing to get your edge back? Because God's right there ready to do the miracle. Are we willing to trust God, cry out to him, and then go back to where we lost it and pick it up? So in closing, my challenge to you is, let's work together as community. Let's build our community as Christ followers. Let's invite others into our community. Even though, again, right now, it doesn't feel like we can invite anybody. But God's right there at the edge waiting. All we got to do is trust him. All we got to do is let him work the miracle for us. And we just got to walk in our purpose. Let me pray for you. So, Father, we just thank you, God, for your word. We thank you, God, that your word, no matter where it's found in the Bible, it's relevant to us that you're always teaching us, you're always causing us to grow. And we just thank you, God, that you do not forsake us and that your word is comforting to us. It draws us near to you, Lord. So Father, I just thank you, Lord, for every single person, Lord, watching today and part of this community here at Calvary Berry, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for their lives, Lord. Thank you for Pastor Adam and his team serving here in in this corner of Barry, Lord, and and the extended communities. I pray, Lord God, as a community together, Lord, we would be able to step up, be challenged by your word, be challenged by who you are, to get our edge back, to be able to drive and cause your love, Lord, to exceed beyond just meeting together in person, Lord, but it would extend through our networks, it it would extend through our devices, Lord that we would be able to draw and create community, Lord, around your word, around who you are, Lord, and around the price that you paid for us and bought us into your kingdom. So Father, I just thank you, Lord, because you are good, Lord, and you do not forsake us. You always help us get what we lost, and you care about the little things. So Jesus, we invite you in. We want to take another step in our journey towards you. And so, Father, I'm appreciative of who you are. And I thank you, Lord, for every single person here today. And we pray, God, that you would just be with us through the rest of our week. We would be challenged by your word. And we we would grow with you. We would take another step with you. And we would welcome others into your kingdom, Lord. We pray all these things, Lord, in your name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.